psych exam review session number one. This is going to be a quick session tonight, um, and uh, you, um, you'll you'll notice that a lot of the stuff is just going to re be review. All the stuff that we've talked about, it's it's basically an introduction to all the stuff that we have been talking about all year. So we'll move kind of quickly through it. But if there's any questions, feel free to stop uh, and an ask any questions in the in the chat window, or uh, if you want to unmute your microphone and and just talk to me, you can. So. Um, so tonight's review session is going to be quick, but tomorrow, um, just uh, hang on, because tomorrow will be probably the lengthiest of all of them. Tomorrow we're going to cover all the neuroscience, and um, we're going to cover uh, neurotransmissions and things like that, So and brain chemistry and, and brain anatomy. So uh, tomorrow's is probably one of the most important review sessions. If you can make tomorrow, that'd be great. So uh, just to set up what's coming up this week. So we're just going to get right into this. Um, basically, I've just taken kind of uh, all of the presentations that I've showed you in class and kind of boiled them down to their essentials. And I'm just quickly going to go through them and, and just review what we've covered. So the first thing we talked about in the course was psychology as a science and how psychology became a science. And then there's this guy. You'll notice that this guy came in um, on that the, uh, the person chart that I gave you. Um, his, his name is Wilhelm Wundt. He is the first guy that um, really brought psychology in as a science. And um, he set up a uh, psychology lab at the University of Leipzig in Germany. And Wilhelm Wundt is, is credited with the first psychological experiment, the first psychological laboratory, and the first psychology graduate program at the University of Leipzig. So everybody who practiced psychology after... Uh, 1879, when the first psychological experiment was done in this first psychological laboratory. Everybody after that um, has Wilhelm Wundt to kind of thank, and they're all offshoots of Wilhelm Wundt. So he's really the first psychologist. <clears throat> um, then there's some really early forms of psychology um, that you don't have to know much about, but um, you do have to know a little bit about just kind of the, the idea behind them. Um, and that is structuralism is the first branch of psychology. When we talk about all the branches we talk about today, um, you know, cognitive, um, uh, evolutionary, uh, human, humanism, um, psychoanalysis, those kind of things. Structuralism was really the, the foundation of all of those. Um, and structuralism was the first branch of psychology. It's no longer practiced today. That's why we don't talk about it anymore. But um, structuralism basically just, it was uh, designed by Edward Bradford Titchener. And he uh, was a student of Wundt, uh, but he started his own psychology program at Cornell University. And basically, he just um, trained people to report their experiences. So you had to be trained in order to be examined by structuralism. So the first few sessions in structuralism was, was training you on how to get in touch with your own experiences and your own emotions and things like that. It's really unreliable because um, it's all based on your own self-reporting. So. Um, but structuralism was really the first branch of psychology that, that uh, started to dive into people's behaviors and, and emotions and things like that. Then we've got uh, William James. William James um, broke off of structuralism and created this idea of functionalism, uh, again, laying the foundations, not something that's typically practiced today, but, um, but something that's borrowed from in every, every other branch of psychology. And... Um, what re you really need to know William James for is that he really started the first psychology program in America, and he was um, he wrote the first psychology textbook. So um, it was really the first time that people were able to actually go out and purchase a book and, and read about the science of psychology. So he was really influential in making psychology this, this science rather than this kind of pseudoscience that it had been referred to as before. So that's what you need to know about William James. What you have to link him with functionalism, you also have to link him with, um, with really starting psychology in the United States. There's two women in psychology. I don't remember if we talked about these, um, but these psychology was a male-dominated field for a long time, um, and there were two women who tried to... Mary Calkins was a study of, uh, student of William James, and she was the first woman to earn a PhD um, in psychology, but she wasn't awarded the first PhD because psychology was a male-dominated field and uh, the, the men in the field would not award her a PhD. So according to William James, she was a doctorate of psychology. She had a PhD in psychology, but um, she never actually got the certificate because, um, because she was a woman. 
And then Margaret Floyd Washburn um, was the first one to actually get the piece of paper that says she was a doctor of psychology. And uh, they were both involved in the American Psychological Association and president of that organization. So those are just two women that um, were influential in the start of psychology. Um, there's this idea. I don't know if we talked about gestalt psychology. Um, I'm not sure how much of this got covered in the beginning of class because we did start off with memory. So I'm not sure exactly where we started off. Um, but gestalt psychology is this really, um, it, it's an idea that says that, if you look at the third bullet point there, the whole is not equal to the sum of the parts. And it's not that the whole is greater than the sum of the parts. It's just not equal to the sum of the parts. And Gestalt psychologists focus on perception. And they try to figure out how, I think we did look at these. They, they try to figure out how you can see faces in this Rubin vase. Why is it that the face is not actually drawn, but yet your, your eyes can, you, your, your brain can perceive faces when actually what's the only thing that's drawn is a face. I mean, is a vase. You can see the face in the vase. So this idea of Gestalt psychology is trying to figure out how our brain perceives these things. How, do you, how does your brain perceive this box as three-dimensional when really we know it's two-dimensional, it's just sitting there on the screen. So, um, so how is it that, that, uh, that your brain is putting together the parts and coming up with a whole that's different than the sum of the parts? So it's the idea that your brain plays a key role in, in psychology as a science. So um, it's really the start of, of uh, cognitive psychology. Uh, the work, artwork of M.C. Escher is, is an idea, um, is, is a gestalt type. M.C. Escher was a gestalt painter um, because if you look at a lot of the staircases that M.C. Escher painted, um, the sum is not equal, or the whole is not equal to the sum of the parts, meaning that you can't, you can't really figure it out. These stairwells are, uh, are just something you, you just can't wrap your head around. And everybody sees something different, so the whole is, is different than the sum of, of the actual ink on the paper. This is one of those impossible objects that will really play with your mind, um, and it's an idea of that gestalt um, perception. So then the first unit, the reason that I kind of skipped over it and went really quickly through it is because it just introduces you to all the different fields of psychology that we studied later on. So in the prologue of your textbook, if anybody skimmed through it um, in preparation for the quiz tomorrow, you'll notice that really all it did is, is just introduce you to all the fields that you're already familiar with. So it had a little section on psychoanalysis and psychodynamic psychology, and it just talks a little bit about how Sigmund Freud was influential on in that. A um, little bit about who uh, Sigmund Freud was and what he used, but we already all read it cover. Yes, exactly. The textbook is always read cover to cover by every single AP Psych student. Uh, so, um, in case you didn't read, or in case you forgot, um, we uh, we're just gonna. You'll see. You'll probably see some um, some questions on the on the test tomorrow, the quiz tomorrow about the different domains of psychology. And I, I think you're going to ace those questions because we've covered them in so many other units. See, there's a little section on humanism. We know that Carl Rogers, remember, humanism is like Mr. Rogers' neighborhood. So Carl Rogers and Abraham Maslow, the, the Maslow's hierarchy of needs fit into humanism. And that's at environmental influences, love, acceptance, determinism, all that, um, trying to make us self-actualized people, getting up, climbing up these, this uh, hierarchy of needs. And, uh, you know, moving from one step to the next after all the needs have been met. Then there's behaviorism. Uh, behaviorism was uh, originally created by John Watson. Remember, Watson did the study with the rat um, at the Little Albert study where he got the kid petrified of the rat um, and then needed a humanist to go in there and, and get rid of the phobia. Um, but he created behaviorism as a revolt against functionalism. That's why all of these were kind of Functionalism was the launching pad for a lot of these different um, fields of psychology, but uh, functionalism not something that's practiced today, so it's not something you really have to spend a lot of time learning. But behaviorism we do, because that, that's where B.F. Skinner come in, comes in, and as well as Ivan Pavlov, and we get opera and classical conditioning.
This is the Skinner box. Remember, the rat pushes the lever, and it turns off the electrification, electrification or the loud noise or the bright light or the heat or whatever. Uh, it's just trying to get the rat to push the lever when the impulse starts so that it can either you know get food or stop being shocked. And then we've got Pavlov, um, whose dogs thought it was really funny that they were actually playing with Pavlov rather than Pavlov playing with them. So uh, we got Pavlov's dog studies, those kind of things. So what is psychology? Uh, psychology is, the definition is, the, the sci scientific and systematic study of behavior and mental processes. What is behavior? It's actions we can observe and measure. What are the mental processes? Well, they're internal subjective experiences we infer from behavior. So that's what psychology is as a science. The biggest questions are nurture nature questions, um, which influences the person most, their heredity and biology, which is their nature, or their upbringing and surroundings, which is their nurture. Um, the, the, the prologue to your textbook talks a little bit about Socrates and Plato as um, philosophers who really kind of thought, were the first ones to think about how your mind um, plays a role in your behavior. And then Aristotle and John Locke wrote a little bit later on that. And if you want you know, information on, on how they influenced the early psychologists, you can read the prologue of your textbook. Um, so we know that the answer to the nature-nurture question is both. And nature gives us what we got, but we have the power and ability to nurture things from there. This is the mo probably the most important part from the, from the prologue, is that today's approach to psychology is a biopsychosocial approach. So we look at the biology, we look at the brain structure, brain anatomy, we look at the neurochemical uh, reactions that happen inside the brain, we look at the psycholo psychological ideas, the how we think and, and how we behave and why we behave in a certain way, and then we also look at the sociocultural influences, peer influences, and, and how we're raised, how we're nurtured, basically. So the biopsychosocial approach, you will absolutely see that term somewhere on the AP exam, hopefully not in the FRQ. Well, actually, it wouldn't be a bad thing to have in the FRQ because it's pretty easy to understand. Uh, but guaranteed you're going to see that word on the AP exam somewhere in some multiple choice question. All right. Uh, so this is these are the six contemporary theoretical perspectives. And you should know all of these. We've got the psychoanalytic the behavioral, the humanistic, the cognitive, the biological, and the evolutionary. Um, so these are all uh, the different domains that we've talked about throughout the year and the different psychologists that are uh, part of those. And if you look at your, your uh, contributors to psychology chart that I gave you, you'll see that all of these psychologists are in there and they're listed under their domains. So, uh, so that's it, that's the prologue. Um, and then chapter one was all about thinking critically. Um, oh, we try to answer this question, how, how can we best do psychology to understand why people think, feel, and act the way that they do? We talked about intuition, how intuition is, oh, that slide didn't come out right, how intuition is very limited. You know, well, it uh, didn't come out very good, but uh, if you drop a bullet off the table that's three feet high, fire another one straight across an empty field, which one hits the ground first? Intuition would tell you that the one that's fired hits the ground well after the one that's dropped, but uh, that's why we know that intuition is flawed. So we need something more than intuition to uh, to get our empirical findings um, and, and base our theories off of those. So uh, hindsight bias um, is a term that comes up over and over and over again, something that you really you really need to know hindsight bias. And that's finding out that something has happened makes it seem inevitable. Um, so the idea that uh, you find out the... the uh, uh, you find out some the result of something, and, and you say, "Oh yeah, that's right. I, I knew that was that was like that all along," um, and it, it just makes it seem inevitable. So common sense describes what has happened more easily than it predicts what will happen. So when you hear that something happened in a certain way, uh, you just intuitively think that 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 was natural, and and, and anyone could have predicted it. There's overconfidence, tendency to overestimate the accuracy of our current knowledge. And we did a little overconfidence study um, when we uh, did that uh, little activity to figure out um, which uh, it, we, we judged our confidence based on some, some pretty simplistic uh, questions. Um, so scientific attitude, uh, it's important to understand that to go into the scientific attitude, we need curiosity, skepticism, and humility, and critical thinking, 
scientific method. We'll get into that later. Um, uh, theory, we'll talk about that later as well. Remember we talked about astrology, the difference between astrology and psychology. And astrology is based on intuition and it's based on, it, it's a pseudoscience. It's not based on empirical data. So if we want to make a science, we want to we want to bring um, bring credence and bring credibility to the to the field of psychology, then we have to figure out a way to get some empirical data. And we do that through the scientific method, which again we'll get into later. So there's three research methods um, that psychologists use. They either use description, which observes and records behavior, correlation, which uncovers naturally occurring relationships, and experimental, which explores cause and effect. And experimental is the only one that gives us that empirical data that we can chart and graph and, and uh, do longitudinal studies on. But those are the three types of uh, studies that can be done in psychology. So description. In description, we use case studies, surveys, and naturalistic observations. Um, so case studies, remember we looked at Phineas Gage as like the perfect case study, um, really the first case study that was done in psychology. Just looking at one person to describe a particular rare phenomenon, um, like examples, people who have tried to assassinate the president, you can't obviously do a, a group study on that um, using uh, using variables, independent and dependent variables, because there's not that many people. So you have to do uh, case studies, right? Pretty easy. And again, if I'm going too fast, uh, stop me. We know there's limitations. They don't provide evidence to test theories. They rely on observations of a single investigator. So whoever does the case study is obviously biased. So there's no way to rule that out. Then there's the survey. There's key things that we have to cover in survey. Uh, and that is the wording effect, and that is how the question is worded depends on, the, the question is answered uh, depending on how it's worded, like 77% uh, of people responding were interested in plants and trees, but only 39% were interested in botany, um, so it all depends on how you ask the question, so the wording effect is really important. And sampling, we talked about different types of sampling. Um, that most surveys or most uh, studies use a, a random sample, which means that each member of a population has equal chance of inclusion into a sample. So if I'm studying, um, if I'm studying uh, high school girls at Granby who play lacrosse, mm -hmm. then every single high school female lacrosse player at Granby should have an equal chance to get into that sample, so that I can study study them unbiased. Um, and if the survey sample is biased, then the results are not valid. For example, if I took all the Granby High School girls lacrosse players in my psychology class and studied them, obviously there's going to be a bias because there's there's uh, it, it won't be a, a good um, sampling of everybody in in the population. So sampling. <laughs> Naturalistic observation is just recording the behavior of someone in the natural environment, or as close as you can get to the natural environment. A lot of natural ob naturalistic observations are done in laboratories, but they try to create the, as the natural environment as best as they possibly can inside the laboratory. But a lot of naturalistic observations are just done in nature. Somebody will just observe you doing what you normally do in everyday life. Correlational studies, we talked about the correlational coefficient. Uh, if it's positive, that means that as um, the well, the, as one trait or behavior goes up, the other goes up as well. Or negative, as one goes up, the other goes down. And we talked about these graphs here. A perfect positive correlation would be a plus one, and that means that as one goes up, the other goes up. And a perfect negative would be a negative one. As one goes down, the other one goes up. And we never get plus one or negative one in a correlational study. It's always something in between. If you have a zero, uh, a zero uh, score, then then that means that there's absolutely no correlation whatsoever. So usually the scores are somewhere between zero and I think the highest correlation study I've ever seen is like a 0 0.95. So usually somewhere between you know 0 0.8 would be a pretty strong correlation. 0 0.6 would be a pretty weak correlation. Uh, or it would be a weaker correlation, those kind of things. So when you see the um, correlational coefficient, if you see the, the R, if you see, there, there could be a question that would say, uh, correlational study was done where R equals positive 37. Describe that correlation. And you'd have to say that it is a weak positive correlation. Um, or, or you'd have to know that as, as one variable goes up, the other one goes up as well. And some examples of that would be positive correlation, uh, 
the more you study, or let's say the more you read your textbook, the higher your GPA might be. Uh, that would be a positive correlation. Negative correlation would be the the um, would be the the amount of time the absences to GPA, and then and then no correlation would be height to GPA. We know that that has absolutely no correlation. So the question is, do you do we need to remember what R equals? They will most likely they will tell you what R equals. You don't need to know the math that goes into this. Remember, there's no calculations whatsoever on the AP Psych exam. So you will you'll never have to do any math. There was um, last year there was a really strange curveball thrown in the FRQ where they made you do a bar graph, um, but that's the the first and only time I've ever seen that. And I've looked through every single released FRQ. They release the FRQs every year, and I've looked through all of them. Well, I think of uh, uh, most of them anyway. And and the only one that really dealt with numbers was was last year. They had you do a bar graph, but again, no calculations. Um, they gave you all the data that you had to then um, put into a graph. So all you have to know is what R is, what R stands for. And if the, there's a question about the correlational coefficient, they're going to give you the number. They're going to say R equals 0.37 or R equals 0.8. Um, so what does that mean? So you don't have to know. Um, the only thing you have to know is that R is the correlational coefficient. And they'll tell you it's a correlational study, too, obviously. They're not just going to say R equals 37. What does that mean? They'll say in a correlational study when the correlational coefficient equals 37. So you'll have a good understanding of what that means. But we know correlation is not causation. There's been several multiple choice questions on correlation and causation. Um, and just know that, that if something is correlated, it doesn't necessarily mean that it's caused. Like people that floss every day live three years longer than those that don't. That is a correlation. That is a correlation that can be proved. It's probably a weak correlation, but it is a correlation. But we know that that doesn't people that flossing doesn't cause you to live longer. And then here's another bunch of examples of those. Here's a family circus. I wish they didn't turn on that seatbelt sign so much. Every time they do, it gets bumpy. Uh, so yes, there is a correlation, but there's not causation. There's also illusory correlation or the illusion that there is correlation. Um, and this happened, This is a psychological principle um, where you think that there's correlation, like the phone always rings when you're in the shower, or the elevator always seems to be headed in the wrong direction, or always rains after you wash your car. That's illusory correlation. That there's no actual correlational coefficient. There's not even a formula that can be done. Um, but uh, a lot of people do believe in illusory correlations. Experimentation, this is actually something that's not really important. Um, experimentation is, is really easy because you've all done it in your science classes over and over again since probably sixth grade. Um, and that is forming a hypothesis or asking a question, doing a little background research, constructing a hypothesis, testing that hypothesis, analyzing those results, drawing a conclusion, and then determining whether your hypothesis is true or false. If your hypothesis is true, you go ahead and report the results. If your hypothesis is false, then you go back and construct a different hypothesis to run a different experiment to try to figure out the truth. So uh, it's just the ex experimental method. Everybody's probably familiar with that. Um, the only thing that you may not be familiar with is something in psychology called the null hypothesis. And actually, it's in other sciences as well, but often used in psychology is the null hypothesis, where you don't necessarily have to prove your hypothesis. You could also disprove a null hypothesis. Like, hypothesis would be gender has an effect on perceived intelligence. Now let's design an experiment to test that. A null hypothesis would be gender does not have an effect on perceived intelligence. So let's design an experiment to test that. So these are some key terms that are going to be, that I've seen um, frequently on the AP exam and things that you have to know for experimental uh, for psych psychological experiments. Uh, that is the double blind procedure. That's the way most psychological experiments are done where the only the the researcher himself knows uh, which patients are receiving treatment and which patients have a placebo. And then the that experiment, the, the actual um, person who's running the experiment doesn't have any contact with the patients at all. So he sends his, his assistance out to have contact with the patients and deliver the drugs and all that stuff and they have no clue whether the patients are receiving the placebo or not so the double blind procedure is everybody involved in the experiment obviously with the exception of the person who's running the experiment is blind as to as to who's getting treatment and who's not 
be, and that is a way to eliminate the placebo effect, which I'm sure you all are familiar with. That's thinking that you're getting a treatment can have an effect on the outcome. And then uh, whenever you're evaluating therapies, you should always use random assignment um, that's assigning participants to experimental controlled conditions by random assignment. Uh, so, so everybody has an equal opportunity to be in both the experiment and control groups. And nobody knows which group they're in. Uh, variables, again, these are things that you've covered uh, probably a great deal in science, um, but real quick, the independent variable is manipulated, the dependent variable is measured. Um, and then two things you may not have a lot of familiar with, familiarity with are the control variables and the confounding variables. Control variables are things that are kept constant to try to prevent their influence on the effect. We did, we did a lot of uh, um, activities and, and uh, scenarios with the controlled variable uh, when I presented this way back in September you remember that far back. Um, and then confounding variables are things that you can't control that needs to, they need to uh, be noted, they need to be noted in the findings. Independent variables ask the question, what do I change? Dependent, what do I observe? Controlled, what do I keep the same? Confounding, what uninteresting variables might affect independent variable and dependent variable? And the whole idea behind experimental variables is that the manipulator the experimenter manipulates the independent while measuring the dependent. So if you can remember that line right there, you've got the variables down pat. Experimenter manipulates the independent variable and measures the dependent variable, and then tries to control all other variables. Examples, looking at fertilizer's effect on plant growth. Independent variable would be the amount of fertilizer used. Dependent variable would be the growth. That's what's being measured. And the control variables would be the type of plant, the type of fertilizer, amount of sunlight. So you're making sure that one plant doesn't get more sunlight because that would be a variable that would affect the growth. So you have to make sure that everybody has equal sunlight, equal size pots, equal size everything, so that so that you can really isolate the independent variable um, and its effect on the dependent variable. Here's just a. a summary of, of the three different types of research methods, descriptive, correlational, experiment. So the descriptive observes and records behavior. Those are case studies, surveys, naturalistic observations. Correlation detects naturally occurring relationships. Those are statistical associations, sometimes among survey responses. And then experimental explores, experimental is the only one that explores cause and effect. And experiments, as it says, sometimes experiments are just not feasible. Um, just because there's so many things you have to control that it, sometimes you just have to use other research methods and then try to extrapolate the data from those to try to try to make it uh, experimental. Then we talked about mode, median, mean, and median. Again, these are things that you've covered in math class. Um, we talked about range and standard deviation, uh, central tendency versus variation. Um, central tendency is how much is it like or average is it like the average of the norm and that central tendency is going to be measured with standard deviations and the standard bell curve um, and then variation how much does it vary uh, from the norm you're going to note, note that in standard deviation this is the bell curve this is something that you really need to be extremely familiar with if you don't understand how this bell curve works and how standard deviations um, work then you should um, probably see me before the AP exam so that we can go over it um, oh, go back to that slide real quick. Last slide. So central tendency. So, um, so that bell curve in the standard deviation, um, you will have several questions that will regard. Hopefully, I can move on now. Maybe. Uh, hopefully, you had enough time with that. Um, so you're going to have several questions that are going to deal with this bell curve because it is essential to standardization and. All psychological tests, intelligence tests, um, everything that measures anything that is important in psychology is going to be standardized, and it's going to be standardized based on this bell curve. So uh, the mean is the most important here. That's the arith arithmetic, arithmet arithmetic, arithmet anyway, the, the average score, and that that it doesn't matter what the average score is. It can be 1,600, it can be 23,000, whatever that average score is, is going to get that center line. 
And then there's a calculation to figure out standard deviation, but again, you won't have to figure it out. If you're given a data set, they're going to tell you what the standard deviation is. So you're never going to have to figure out the standard deviation from a data set. We did that in class when we did the M&M um, activity, where you had to find the standard deviation of the M&Ms in the pack. But that was the only time you'll ever have to do that. I just wanted you to understand where it came from. And I don't know, you probably don't remember it, but um, so the standard deviation just tells you how far apart your data is from the mean. And it allows you to describe your data with, with uh, percentage accuracy. So you can say that 95% of my, uh, I, I'm pretty confident that 95% of my data falls within two standard deviations of the mean. Anything outside of those are called extreme outliers, and when we look at intelligence, we're going to be focusing on those people who are more than two standard deviations away from the mean, because those are the people that are going to require the most attention. So standard deviation gives us a ton of information, and this bell curve is, is really, really important. So if you don't um, understand that bell curve, then uh, then you should, we should probably sit one-on-one -on -one and, um, and figure that out, because... Um, like I said, there's going to be a lot of questions that are going to have that are going to involve standard deviation and and data sets like that. So, so we just have to wrap our heads around that. Um, as far as st st statistical significance, love that word. Um, we have to figure out um, standard deviation in order to figure out whether the information we have is statistically significant. So we have to figure out would the results have happened by chance, or would the re was the result actually um, because of the movement of the independent variable. Um, there's this thing called the Hawthorne effect. I, I've, I've never seen that. Um, it's in your notes. If you want to take a look at it, great. Uh, I wouldn't spend a whole lot of time thinking about it. The last part of unit one talked about ethics and psychology. So that's, that's all the information we have about um, experiments and how psychologists gather the data and how we actually make psychology a science rather than the pseudoscience it was before uh, for the 1800s when Wilhelm Wundt uh, started to get empirical data. Are there any questions on on how we gather that information or how psychology is a science? Anything anything about what we just covered? That's going to be the bulk. That's basically the bulk of Unit One. That's what most of your questions for your uh, quiz are going to be on tomorrow. So hopefully we covered that. All right. Looks like. Uh, Looks like we're good. So the last part is about ethics, and really the only thing you have to know about ethics is uh, that the ethics codes are established by the, the American Psychological Association, or the APA, and these didn't, uh, when, when the PowerPoint got converted, it uh, messed up a lot of the, the formatting. But you see the dark bullet points are the ones that uh, that are what what are included. So deception, and then consent, and protection from psychological harm. Um, those are the, those are the key points there. They're just not. There's no indentation here. So deception is necessary in all psychological experiments, but we have to keep the deception to a minimum, and we have to we have to keep the deception to a point where it's it's crucial to the to the to the study. You can't deceive somebody. Um, for reasons that are not crucial to the to the outcome of the experiment, and uh, everybody has to be informed of their of how they were deceived after the experiment is over. Um, consent has to be given. Um, informed consent is is absolutely crucial to the data. If you don't have informed consent from your participants, then the data is considered invalid by the American Psychological Association, and which means that your study will never get published. Uh, protection of participants from physical and psychological harm. So uh, again, the, the, a lot of the experiments that we look at in our textbook um, ignored this fact, but it was before the ethics codes published by the APA. So therefore, we're still looking at the results of those studies, and, and they're still important parts of um, the history of psychology. So the, the key ones are deception, consent, and protection from harm, and then the right to withdraw. Um, so all participants are able to stop the experiment at any time, um, and then the right to withdraw data. So if you want to stop the experiment and you want to you uh, make it so that you were never there, um, the psychologist has to destroy all of the data received from you and destroy uh, your total participation in the study so that um, the results 
published will indicate that you actually were never even uh, were never even there. There has to be confidentiality, confidentiality and privacy. Um, in a lot of ways, they do this is they they convert you into a number. So when you start to participate in the study, you're you're from that point forward, um, you're only given a number. So you'll be um, you know subject forty one, and they will never use your real names, and they they protect your privacy that way. And then debriefing, you have to be told exactly what the study was about, what the purpose of it was, and you have to be evaluated to make sure that that no psychological harm was done. Um, so those are the ethics codes. Remember, we talked about the Milgram experiment. That's the one where the the teacher uh, was forced to to shock the learner uh, all the way up to a lethal dose of shock. Um, and if we look through the APA standards today, um, the the Milgram experiment basically violated all of these, um, especially um, especially the right to withdraw because. Um, People in the studies uh, were, were told that they wanted to stop, and the experimenter told them they had to continue. That right there breaks the ethics code. Um, if somebody says they want to stop and they don't want to continue, the experiment has to stop and end right there. So the Milgram experiment would never have been allowed today, but look what we got from it, right? So we got a lot of uh, really valuable information about um, humans um, uh, falling subject to authority. The Stanford Prison Experiment, again, a very unethical study, but done before the APA published its findings. So something that we got a lot of information about, um, you know, we learned a lot about the human mind through that experiment, but, um, but something that was today deemed unethical. We talked a little bit about animal research ethics, whether it's okay to, to research uh, on animals um, and uh, I don't, I don't foresee there being any questions on that. These two studies, though, the, the Milgram experiment and the Stanford Prison experiment, you can guarantee you're going to see uh, questions on those. So, um, and, and they're probably going to be ethical questions, questions that are that are challenging the ethics of psychological experiments. All right, so that's it. That's unit one. Um, so, anybody up for a poll? Put together a couple of polls. Let's let's see how we did here. Um, take a vote here. All right, so didn't trick anybody with that one. Um, remember, these are the ways that you can gather information, experimentation, correlation, naturalistic observation, survey, and case study. And you should have a good understanding of all of those, which naturalistic observation you've got down pat. All right, so we'll stop that one. Let's see. We got another one here. Here's another one. If I say that your phobia and anxiety are related to chemical imbalances in the brain, illogical thinking and impaired social skills, oh, illogical thinking and impaired social skills, I would most likely believe in the. got most of the votes in. Uh, one person said evolutionary perspective, and the rest said biopsychosocial, and biopsychosocial is correct. Uh, one person said advantage of applied research. Um, but the biopsychosocial approach, bio, brain, psycho, illogical thinking, how your brain works, and then uh, social, uh, the social um, aspects, the, the, the nurture aspect of your personality. So biopsychosocial, 
you need to be familiar with that that word. Like I said, it's going to be it's going to be on the test somewhere, some way, shape, or form. So good, most of you got that one. Um, just out of curiosity, um, let's see. Just out of curiosity, just want to know what you think. There's really no right or wrong for this one. Um, out of all the guys that we've talked about, Wundt, Pavlov, Freud, William James, Titchener, just curious to see who you think is the most influential. All right, so percentage-wise, most people say Freud. 26% uh, at Wilhelm Wundt, and one person said Pavlov. Um, again, no right or wrong answer, just curious. Uh, William James, by the way, uh, you wouldn't have that textbook that's collecting dust on your shelf um, that describes all these psychological perspectives if it wasn't for William James. Um, so all of these guys are really important uh, in the study of psychology. All of them laid the foundation for what psychology is today. So um, apparently you guys think Freud was the most influential. All right, I think that's those are all the polls I put together today. I'll try to get more together for the next review session, which, again, is, is probably one of the most important. So if you can be at the next one, um, just block out some time tomorrow night to get to the next one. All right, if there are no more questions, we can wrap up 10 minutes early today. Um, those of you doing uh, a push, I think your review starts in about 10 minutes, so you can go get a drink of water. Um, but everybody else, um, I'll stay online for a little bit um, just to answer any questions for people who maybe didn't want to ask the whole room, uh, review anything that anybody needs. Um, but if you're all all set, then you can go ahead and log off, and I'll see you tomorrow for the review quiz.